Hello everyone. A couple of you wanted me to go more into depth on this lovely gem here, which I'm gonna show you a section of. Evolution, factor belief, stratification, and sedimentary layers. I ran out of room. This tw at least 20 year old video trying to take you through why geology is wrong and it's embarrassingly bad. I don't just mean aesthetically I can deal with that. I mean, there are legitimate PhDs in here who don't know what they're talking about. And I will say that, especially this guy here, he's gonna talk about geochronology, but he's a chemist and I can tell you, he knows two things about geochronology, Jack, and you know what else. And I'm not gonna call anyone a liar, but that only really leaves one other option. He's vastly ignorant of geochronology. So I guess that's possible. We're just gonna say that. Just because someone has a PhD after, I have letters after my name too, doesn't mean they know anything about what they're talking about. And in this episode, this is common. Okay, this isn't really the kind of person you want to talk about uranium lead dating to. Anyway, welcome to the Geophiles. Here's the intro. Let's get into this. Hopefully this won't be too terribly long. You will see up here the video that I'm talking about. I've already done a lengthy video on this, but this particular part is 51 minutes, 33 seconds to a minute and 11 seconds, plus or minus a few seconds. So you're going to see me watch it and I'm gonna put it up here and I'm gonna stop it where need be and roll my eyes. Or maybe I'll put it here. I don't know, the computer's here, so I gotta listen to it. I don't know. Anyway, let's just get started. Our lovely host, Pierre, who also is not a geologist. How old is the Earth? Is it millions of years or just a few thousand years? And what does radiometric dating tell us about the age of rocks? The science of physical chemistry. First, I want to say something. Is the age of the Earth millions of years or thousands of years? Uh, we pretty much know the age of the Earth, plus or minus, but that's an just idea. It's not even a hypothesis. It's just an idea, and it's not based on anything. You want it to be a, th a few thousand years old because this is a young Earth creationist video, but you need to be able to test that. You can't just argue your way out of geochronology. Arguments don't mean fuck all in science other than starting points. You gotta be able to show it. Or you don't have anything. But this guy, Edward, is going to fuck this up so bad that it's it's embarrassing for me to watch. All right, let's keep going here. Can throw some light on these questions. And Professor Edward Bordreau is a physical, inorganic chemist who teaches at a university in New Orleans, Louisiana. So is he a physical inorganic chemist or is he a theoretical quantum chemist? I don't know, I did find him online. His middle initials A, he does write a lot of young earth creationist stuff. Uh, so I don't know, he's a chemist, we'll just stick with that. So, and although geochronology involves elements and compounds, it's more of a physics thing than a chemistry thing. And he has studied these matters, so he should be able to help us. Professor Boudreau, it is explained elsewhere in the program that the strata and the fossils in the rock can give no indication as the age of those rocks. Can you tell us if there are any other methods by which the rocks of the strata can be dated? For example, by carbon-14 dating. Young Earth creations love their carbon-14. I study rocks that are so friggin' old, carbon-14 doesn't even factor into it. Now, 
I want to say something, and I'm going to speak very generically here about carbon-14. Carbon-14 is an organic process. I know carbon in and of itself isn't organic, but the process is. Because I, as long as I am alive and not dead, I will continue to take in carbon-14 to replace anything that might decay, even though I'm not going to live long enough for a significant amount to decay. But once I die, that process stops. When we do things like uranium lead dating or potassium argon, you know, which is what we're going to focus on here, uranium lead or potassium argon dating. When we do this stuff, this is inorganic dating. This stuff is not bound to life. The rocks I study have no life to date. You know, it, they're so old. Well, they're stromatolites, but we don't date those. We date undeformed igneous rocks. We can date other rocks too, but we've got to be able to compensate for that. But if we want a raw age only, the best thing to date are undeformed igneous rocks. Well, let us get one thing clear about carbon-14. It is an unstable radioactive form of the element carbon, which occurs in all living matter. A living organism, when it's alive, is absorbing and expelling carbon, a small amount of which is carbon-14. And at some point in time when that organism dies, the carbon-14 that was present, remaining at the point of death, is what would be detected radioactively. A piece of wood, for example, or a bone, would contain a small amount of carbon-14. Uh, when the the tree which bore the wood or the animal which bore the bone died, that carbon-14 that remained is decaying. It takes thousands of years for the decay process to occur. About 5,760 years for half an original amount of carbon-14 to decay. So by measuring how much of it has decayed, an indication of how long ago the organism was alive can be obtained. As rocks were never alive, they contain no carbon-14. Even the fossils in the rocks cannot be dated by this method because the original living matter in them has turned into stone. Does this mean that the fossils can't be dated by radioisotopes? Well, certainly not by carbon-14 with any degree of reliability. Up until now, we're doing really good. Really good. It's fine for the goals and for speaking to lay people up until this point we're doing pretty good now we've done the basics we've used some sciencey sounding stuff and we've presented okay now we're going to derail and go off the bridge down to another track of another oncoming train that's going to clip us out and basically carnage that's a little exaggerated there but it, it goes downhill fast from here as you know virtually all the fossils are found in sedimentary rocks and because this type of rock rarely contains radioactive elements the fossils have had to be dated by rock strata in which they are found and as we know the latest experiments show that rock strata give no indication of age. Okay, here's where it begins. That is a half-correct statement. Sedimentary rocks and the fossils they contain, we'll just say here we have a cross-section of a sandstone, or not, we'll just use a limestone, all right? And we have our little critters in here, whatever they might be, a little trilobite or... Whatever we got here, I don't know their anatomy. I'm not a paleontologist. So we have our stuff here, sedimentary rocks. Can we directly date these fossils? No, we cannot. That part is true. But to say we can't get any sort of inclining of an age is absolutely false. There's a couple ways I can get an age for these fossils not using other fossils, not doing relative dating, okay? We're going to do absolute dating, which is this. Relative dating is just says this came before 
this which came before this which came before that. that that's basically all it is and until we had this that's really all we had so how can i date this these couple beds of limestone well let's say i've done some preliminary correlation and i so suspect that they are cambrian so they're about you know, 541, or I think this date might have changed. I think this might be 538 now, to about 485. Something like that, million years old. That's what the MA is. Now, I have this. So that's a pretty big gap. Can I narrow it down? Depends. It depends. There's a couple of things that can happen here. I could have, say, a sandstone here. Now, you can do this with the limestone as well, but good luck unless it's got a lot of detritus in it, which most don't. So I got two sandstone layers here. I can pull certain elements and do uranium lead on them, and I'll talk about those elements here in a minute. But I have two sandstones, I pull those elements, I run my test, and say I get in this rock, I get a bunch of dates, but my youngest one is 530 million years old. I'm just... Yeah, this is MA, okay? My youngest, and some of you might remember this from other lectures. Now, I do the same thing here, and my youngest dated minerals come out to be 522 million years or something like that. Okay, so now... You cannot directly date sedimentary rocks using this method, but I have a youngest age of this from my minerals. Zircons, baleolites, those type of things, which I'll get into here. So I have that, which tells me this sandstone has to be this age or younger because it's incorporated zircons from other rocks. You can't incorporate something into a sandstone if that sandstone doesn't exist. So any zircons that have been deposited with it were derived from somewhere else. And that's my youngest one. So that's my maximum age. And so my essentially my sandstone can be this age or younger. Same thing with this. This age or younger. Now, the fact that we have a 522 in there tells us that these two aren't that far apart. We only have two beds. So our oldest one, if we have just 522s, we can do this better. But all we can really say at this point is that this is likely between 530 million years and based on our fossil assemblages, 485 MA, okay? Which is better than this. But what if another thing happens? Okay, we're going to keep this here, our sandstone, all right, but we're going to put a nice lava flow on top. And we know it's a flow and not a sill, even though there might be more rocks above this, because we have hard ground and pits and things where, like, they call them vesicles, where gas gets out and they're near the top of the layer. So we have that. This we can directly date. So we directly date this, and we get an age of 527 million years old. Yes, there would be margins of errors with these, but this is for demonstration purposes. So my sandstone is 530, then this is 527. So this sandstone is pretty close to this age of its youngest zircon. This doesn't always happen, but this is for demonstration purposes. So now I know my fossil beds, my limestone fossil beds, are between 530 and 527 million years old. And that fits perfectly within to our correlations based on fossils that this is Cambrian. Now, if we got wacky numbers, that would be different. But if we have a firm understanding of the area and the stratigraphy is pretty simple, not a lot of stuff going on, mountains, faults, that kind of stuff, we generally get this pretty close before we do any dating. And if we had really crazy numbers, we would question our methods and did we screw up? We wouldn't assume the Earth is 6,000 years old because, you know, it's more likely that I fucked up than the Earth is 6,000 years old. But that's basically the ways you can do it. Now let's get back to this here. 
So, all right. Other types of rocks, such as crystalline rocks, which do not contain fossils, and lava do sometimes contain radioactive elements, and these isotopes are used to date them. Can you tell us, in simple terms, how you date a fossil or rock with a radioisotope? Yes. Uh, let us take a radioactive element such as uranium. This element decays very slowly into a non-radioactive element, which is lead. Now, the rate of the decay can be measured in the laboratory. So by comparing what's left of the uranium element in the rock with the amount of decayed lead element that was formed, and knowing the rate of decay, an idea can be had of how long it has taken for the lead to form. So, if half of the uranium has decayed into lead, and by knowing how long it takes for uranium to decay into lead, yes. you can tell the age of the rock. That's the theory. Why do you say theory? Surely if it's a process you can observe and measure, it must be a fact. Not at all. Here we go, and he's just going to continue on with it. A scientific theory is not a guess. He's going to say fact. Too. The theory is not below a fact. Facts are just bits of data. Theories are so well established that they are essentially facts in and of themselves based off of evidence. But he's going to talk, he's going to sit here and he's going to just plant that in your mind. And that picture you, I saw that I told you to watch, we're going to get back to that. Look again at the diagram. You can see that there are a number of uranium particles, the orange ones, and a number of lead particles, the blue ones. Here we have to make three major assumptions. The first is that all of the lead particles were originally uranium particles. I want you to note that because this diagram is excessively misleading. I don't know if the producers did this or if Edward did it or, or sanctioned it or what, but it is misleading and it is incorrect. And I'll explain why here in a minute. But there is no reason to believe that there were not some lead particles in the rock when it was formed. You see, there is plenty of natural lead in rocks that doesn't come from uranium at all. Really? Yes. Really? Yes. <laughs> anyway. All right. Here's the problem with that. First of all, according to those diagrams, what did that look like to you? If you don't know anything about geochronology, what did that look like? That looked like you had a rock, right? And rocks are made of minerals, which are made of compounds or single elements, okay? Like you can have a rock made of copper, right? They have some. And they just threw their atoms in here haphazardly throughout, right? Giving the impression that they're just there when this rock forms, that they're just floating around in the rock. That is absolutely 100% false for dating purposes. Might there be a couple? Yeah, but we don't date these. This isn't what we date. That was just wrong, false, wrong, false. <laughs> anyway, so what do we date, Steve? Like I said before, rocks are made of what? Minerals. And, you know, basically igneous rocks are crystalline. Some are aphanitic, which is fine crystalline. Some are phaneritic, which is coarse crystalline. But they have crystals in them. And they'll be made entirely of crystals. I'm not going to draw a bunch of crystals here, but I'm just going to draw certain ones. And we are going to use the mineral zircon. There are different minerals you can use to date, depending on what you're dating. But for uranium lead, it's usually zircon and badiolite, which I cannot spell off the top of my head. We're going to stick with zircon because it's essentially the same process anyway. And the chemical formula for zircon is essentially zirconium, Zr, silicon, Si, oxygen, O4. That's essentially it. Now... I will try to say zirconium when I mean zirconium and zircon when I mean zircon. Sometimes I flip them in my head. I apologize. I will correct them on screen in the edits if I do that. So these are your zircons. What do we do? Well, we break this rock up physically. We physically smash this thing to bits. 
and we can separate out those zircons because zircons fortunately are excessively heavy minerals compared with things like quartz and feldspars so we'll have well i'll do it in black we'll have oh no blue blue's better we'll have a zircon crystal now this is not the exact shape of most zircons okay but we have that so now we have our crystal and they're usually micrometers something like that they're usually not very big but you know we can separate gold from sediment we can pull zircons from a rock okay so we have this mineral this is what's dated this let me tell you something about zircon zircon first of all before you, know, you might be like zr what i'll get to that anyway zircons are high temperature forming minerals they form directly from a melt a magma or lava melt okay they form directly from that from cooling those of you who have followed me know what bones reaction series is these are not on bones because once they crystallize they're essentially immortal all right especially at the earth's surface that's why they're so great they can mechanically weather but once they're formed that's it you're not going to change them in any way now through heat and pressure metamorphism you can lose daughter element when we're talking about radiometric dating always the first element is your parent this is your daughter so you decay from your parent to your daughter at a specific half-life which is logarithmic you guys can go anywhere on the internet to find this it's everywhere just get the language straight in your head because i'm going to talk about them in that way as well well something can happen with zircon and we'll get into it after we watch a little bit more of this video remember he's like there's uranium in rock and there's lead in rock yeah so but we don't date the free-floating elements or weird compounds we date these and these are extremely extremely stable they do mechanically weather but other than that they're as stable as quartz is essentially let's get back to the video here let us take the extreme case if this rock contained radioactive uranium and no lead then the lead that would appear as a consequence of uranium decay would be a fairly accurate measurement of the age of that rock or to take a more likely situation that at least some of the lead was in the rock when it was formed, then the age of the rock is much less than we are led to believe. Then there's the matter of leaking out due to solubility. Could that happen? Most definitely. We'll get back to the solubility thing here because that's even worse. As you can see, he has a rock in his hand. It doesn't matter if there's lead throughout that entire rock. If that rock has no zircons in it, I'm not going to date it. I don't care if the half of it's uranium and half of it's lead just floating around in a rock, just, you know, atoms floating around, not bound to anything. I'm not going to date it. I'm going to only date it if it has this. Now, zircons, the zirconium can get substituted by other elements like uranium can come into this lattice and substitute our zircon. Uranium is excessively rare, so the vast majority of the zircon is still gonna be this. Now, I will have those somewhat distributed throughout the crystal. It doesn't matter. They are bound, that is stable. It's not just floating around in a rock or sediment somewhere randomly as dispersed elements. Now, so that can happen just for all intents of, I'm trying to simplify things for you here, guys. So yeah, you can have your uranium substitute for that. So after a while, what happens? Well, my uranium is going to decay into, now there's different isotopes. We're not going to get in that. My uranium is going to decay into lead. What do you know about the properties of lead? It's not this simple, but for all intents and purposes, it is. Think about lead. How many of you have ever had lead figurines? Yes, they still make them, by the way. Have you ever tried to melt lead on your stove? Can you? Yeah, you can. You can melt lead really easily 
on a stove. The reason being is because it's a very low melting temperature. That's why it melts readily. Good luck trying to melt a zircana on a stove. Seriously. I mean, <laughs> this, this thing melts well, well over. Oh, I don't know the exact number. But it might be close to 2,000 degrees Celsius, plus or minus. I don't really know off the top of my head. But, you know, I'll put it on the screen if I find it. So your melt your, that this is derived from will likely be cooler, but you can still have atoms around that will form this. So you can't start forming crystals until things that react with one another come into contact with one another at a stable temperature. It's a whole concept behind Bones Reaction Series. So this happens. Well... Like he said, how do you know that's not from lead already in there? Because lead, even if lead wasn't a low temperature mineral and could crystallize at the same temperatures that zircon does, it would not be in the zircon when it crystallizes. Why? Because lead cannot physically substitute for the zirconium in a zircon. This is a chemical impossibility. So any lead has to be from decay. It has to be. It doesn't matter if there's a ton of lead around it or whatnot. And for all intents and purposes, that's it. So that's why we use zircons. We don't just use the random igneous rock. Okay, we use the minerals in that random igneous rock. Now you can get what's called parent enrichment. There we're talking about daughter enrichment. You know, though there's already lead in the rock, so it can decay and there'll still be lead in the rock, which doesn't matter. Now that can happen in certain things, but this, it's practically impossible. Any lead in there is from decay. Now what's gonna happen? Lead, remember, is a low temperature melting element. Now, it is in this crystal lattice at this point. So your uranium has been decaying into lead over millions of years. You have some, let's make our uraniums, let's make our leads red. All right, so you have, whoop, you have some leads in here, okay, just strewn about anywhere in here. It's going to decay at random equally over any part. So we have that. And we still have a ton of uraniums in here. So we've got uraniums all over this thing. So our rock can't be that old. We haven't even hit one half-life yet. Okay. So it's younger than one half-life. So now you have this situation. And we're going to bury this igneous rock. Put it under low-grade metamorphism, heat and pressure. What's going to happen? You are going to lose daughter elements. The lead is going to leach out, if you will. Why is it going to do that, not the uranium? Because that uranium is locked into that lattice. This lead is just there. Or Because remember, lead can't substitute for zirconium. So you, what happens in this situation, now you have less lead than before. So what's going to happen with your zircon? It's going to appear younger, which will give us the age of a metamorphic event. Now we can compensate for this to get an actual age, which I'll show you briefly here in a minute. But if we started pounding lead into here for some reason that defies the laws of physics, and he's going to mention this, we would get something that looks older, all right? But even if, even if that did happen, you would have to put so much lead into that zircon to make the thing look <laughs> millions of years old for your 6,000 year old earth, it's not going to matter. It's just, it would be ridiculous. Your crystal would destabilize and you'd be done. Okay. So how do we compensate for these metamorphic events? Well, we use something called a Concordia diagram or plot. Now on there is a theoretical 
curve, as it's called. Remember, theories aren't guesses. An idealized curve, same thing, of that decay rate. Now, the natural world isn't always like this. There's some that have been like this. Like We've seen them coming, and we know that's a crystallization age. But usually what happens is you do this, and when, depending on your half-lives or whatever, you'll have ages here, and we'll just say, well, we'll do it this way. This is today. This is four and a half billion, okay? And then what will happen is we will get something that's like this. Cluster here, maybe a cluster here, maybe a cluster here, and like this. So, oh, wow, Steve, what does this mean? That looks like, that looks bad. Well, it forms a line. I, I know this isn't perfect. Don't get on it. It's not meant to be perfect. I can't draw a straight line on a dry erase board. Deal with it. Just assume that's a straight line. Now, this is my metamorphic age, or one of them. And that's probably what? I don't know, 2 billion? And our actual age is here, which is probably, what, 3.5? So that's how we do it. That's how we compensate it in the simplest way I can explain it. It's not that simple, but for most of you, that's as good as I need to explain it. So as you can see, this is a lot more complicated than just taking a rock, pulling out uranium and leads, and counting. That's not how this is done. All right, let's let Ed... Give you some more stellar advice here. Salts of uranium and uh, other radioactive elements uh, are quite uh, capable of dissolving in water and uh, therefore will be removed from the sample. So if the rock had been exposed to water for some period of time, such as during a flood, some of the uranium could have been washed out. This would mean that the age ascribed to the rock would be much too great. That got me second to worst. Made me pound my head and face palm so bad. Zircon is not water soluble. There's our zircon again. You can piss all over this for a thousand years and it's going to still look like this. You might round the edges a tiny bit, but it's still going to be ZrSiO4. Now, you can get zoning in these, and this usually happens during metamorphism. So if we want an absolute date, we want to get as close center as possible because we're going to get metamorphic dates as we go on it. Because remember, the lead's going to leach out. So it's going to easily leach out from here first. Here, not so much, but it will eventually get through. And here, probably not at all. That's an oversimplified diagram, but that's zoning within a zircon. We don't dissolve zircons, batiolites, in water. That is not what happens. Not at all. It's irrelevant. The fact that you can dissolve things in water, which is a great solvent, there's a reason why it's called the universal solvent, but when it comes to zircons and uranium lead dating, it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. It means fuck all. <laughs> You're, it's, this is Getting bad. See how this is getting bad? And if you don't know anything about radiometric dating and you are on the fence whether or not it's legitimate or if the Earth is 6,000 years old, you might find this argument compelling, but it's it doesn't matter because it's complete bullshit in its entirety, except for the first part when he's talking about carbon-14. But surely there must be other radioactive uh, material and elements which are more reliable than uranium. Well, there's radioactive thorium, and uh, there is uh, strontium uh, and rubidium, uh, and there's potassium. Uh, but these are no more reliable than uranium. Uh, the salts of these latter elements are even more soluble in water than the uranium salts. Hold on. We do not date 
I'm going all Karen Caps here. Salts. That isn't something we do. The fact that a potassium salt or a calcium salt can dissolve in water doesn't matter. You know what? I want this guy, and I said this in my other video, Eddie here, to take a zircon, put it in water at STP, and I want him to see how long that takes to dissolve. And if it happens before his great-grandchildren die, I will leave a thousand bucks to his great-great-grandchildren. It's just not a chemical possibility. I can't believe he's spouting. He, he, when he's talking about salt, he's right. Salt dissolves in water, but we don't fucking date salt. Yeah, we do not date salt. All right, let's go. Move on. So a worldwide flood would have made all these methods useless. Uh, most definitely. Let me give you an example of how water can affect radioactive dating. Less than 200 years ago, the Hawaiian volcano Kilauea uh, erupted, and uh, the lava which uh, emerged from that eruption was submerged in water. It was subsequently dated by the potassium argon method. Clearly, it should have shown the age of the lava to be about 200 years. The date recorded, however, was 22 million years. Obviously, the highly soluble potassium salt had leaked out of the sample and left it looking very old. Other samples taken from Haululae volcano lava from 1801 were dated between 160 million and 3,000 million years old. The situation gets worse and worse. I'm not sure if I'm crying or laughing at this point. When you do dating, first of all, you have to make sure the rock you are dating can be dated for your purposes. What do I mean by that? Well, we're going to take his talk at face value here, but he still fucks it up. All right. But like in a volcanic sequence, you are not going to absolutely date a pyroclastic flow. Why? because that has rock incorporated in it from the volcano it came from, which pre-existed before that flow existed. So you could accidentally grab a rock, especially if you don't know what you're looking at, and a lot of it could look exactly the same, and get a really old date and be like, aha, the evolutionists and the evidences say that they are wrong. Hence, the Earth is 6,000 years old, which... Doesn't matter, because even if it was wrong, that no way says the Earth is 6,000 years old. But that aside, you could be pulling detrital zircons from the detritus that existed before that volcano blew up and incorporated that into its pyroclastic flow. We try not to date that stuff directly. Now, you can if you have to, but you have to be careful. And if you get wonky numbers, because science, you have to make predictions. If I expect this to date, and I have no reason, to, like say there's no complex stratigraphy or structural enigmas going on here, it should fall within what I think it should fall within. And 99% of the time, it will. However, the second part, other than making sure you are dating what you're supposed to be dating for the purposes intended, point number two is, you can't use any fucking method you want to date anything you want. There are so many different methods to radiometrically date things. But you have to use what's appropriate. Remember in the beginning when he said he wouldn't use carbon-14 to date a mineralized fossil? Well, I wouldn't use potassium argon dating to date a 200-year-old lava flow. Why? Because... The half-life is so long on this, you're not going to get the right answer. Even assuming you picked an actual lava flow and not a pyroclastic flow, which I have my doubts about. But you still need to pick the appropriate method for what you're doing. Like uranium lead is made, we, we use those to date Archean rocks, rocks that are over 3 billion years old. Are we going to get a 200-year-old date? I mean, how many zeros is that? Uh, I'm actually going to write it out so you can see. That's uh, 3 million. Okay, so if we're using it to date a rock we suspect is this old, 
Why would you think that's an appropriate method for something that's this old? It's not. The margins of errors on these are really narrow now, usually a million years or less, depending on the age of the rock. So we've gotten real good at this. And a lot of times we'll need confirmation or something like that. We'll do another method. And most of the time they overlap or are real close to one another. That's called confirmation. That means our method is valid. Okay. For all intents and purposes, we are correct. We have factual information. Okay. So now we can add it to our hypotheses and theories. Have has anyone ever done uranium lead dating, gotten 3 billion years, then done potassium argon and gotten 200 years? No. No, they have not. And if I did get wacky dates, dates that were way different from each other. Now, don't get me wrong. You can contaminate some of these dating methods, okay? But uranium lead is really one that's really hard to do that to, okay? But what was, I, what was my rant on? My train of thought just derailed. I'm sorry. But you need to do the appropriate. So you not only need to date the appropriate rock for the appropriate intent that you're doing the dating on, but you have to use the appropriate method. And if I messed up, if I got wonky dates all over the place and it doesn't match my prediction at all, what am I going to immediately assume as a good scientist right off the bat? The number one first thing I'm, I might have a list. What's the first thing? Did I fuck it up? Because human error is far more likely than an invalidation of a long established repeated method. All right. You have to think about this like a scientist and not some random Yahoo. Okay, who's trying to sell you something based on a conclusion before they even try to get to any sort of research. Okay, so that's the first thing you do. Then if you do it again and you get a nice line, you know you messed up somewhere along the line. And you always do your methods in your paper if you're doing something like that. So people, other people can test it and falsify it or get the same general answer and it's verified. Okay, that's how science works. This is not how science works. But there's also another assumption in radiometric dating, and that is that the rate of decay has remained constant and has not been influenced in the past. There are a number of things which uh, could have uh, influenced uh, rates of decay. Such as? Uh, well, the uh, production of neutrinos from uh, cosmic radiation could have been enhanced. Uh, by a reversal of the Earth's magnetic field or the explosion of a supernova in a nearby star. Uh, science uh, has proclaimed that uh, these events have occurred in the past, and they could have a substantial effect, therefore, on the radioactive decay rate. So, if radiometric dating is no guide, what other methods are available? There are a great many natural processes which uh, date the Earth to be relatively young. Before we get into the last part of this bullshit, Let's address this, especially when it comes to something like uranium lead. This doesn't matter. Why does it, Why don't neutrinos matter? It doesn't matter for most things anyway, because neutrinos do not react with most matter. That's why we have to build these vast, huge, massive tanks underground to catch one or two. Because it, they don't react with matter. 99.9999999999 percent of the time, okay? We're transparent to neutrinos. And even if it did react with something, it's not going to react with these. It's going to react with something else, something lighter, simpler. All right, magnetic reversals, that's just a non-starter. I don't know why he said that. That just, that, I don't know whether that's even based off of this. No reason to assume a magnetic reversal would affect a date or a radioactive decay. Notice how he said we assume it's been constant. Now, there are things that can mess with some dating methods. This one's pretty solid, okay? It's very difficult to mess with this one. It's practically impossible. You can't just assume the decay rate has changed and then make up a bunch of shit 
to explain why you think that happened. You need to be able to demonstrate that has changed. And in order to do that, you have to literally change the laws of physics, literally. And as far as we can tell, that's never happened. And if it did, you wouldn't be standing here watching this video or sitting there or, or running, listening, whatever it is you're doing with this video. You wouldn't be here to contemplate it. So that's just nonsense. And plus, we use radioactive decay for our atomic clocks. It's how we keep accurate time. I mean, why would we use something that physics can whimsically just shit apart? That, for example, if the compelling evidence that the Earth's magnetic field has been decreasing with time is a fact, then we would find that the Earth would be rather young rather than old. One final question, Professor Bordeaux. In your opinion... And there's the uh, old magnetic field straw man there. They don't even really use this one anymore, creationists, because we have so much paleomagnetic data now since this was made. It's just ridiculous. They, they can no legs down. Yeah, the Earth's magnetic field is weakening, but it is not weakening everywhere consistently. And in some places, it's actually getting a tad stronger. It is a dipole, but it's not a perfect dipole, like the South Atlantic anomaly. Does that mean you can just take some sort of average rate of this thing and extrapolate it literally into the past? No. No, no, no. And plus, you don't know how... I mean, what are you going to use for a guide? Are you just going to pick 6,000 years and whatever kind of output you get, we'll just use that term, you get at that 6,000-year mark, you're just going to say, that's as strong as the Earth's magnetic field has ever been? You have literally no reason to say that. We can do paleomagnetism. We know the Earth's magnetic field flips. We know that. Does it take five years? Probably not. Does it take 500? A little more. Does it take 1,000? I don't know. Does it take 5,000? Maybe about that. I, I don't know. But it may not even be a flip. Like, in a geologic time span, it seems to be a flip. But it might be a slow transition. Not only that, but there's been times during this last normal period for the past 700,000 years where it's temporarily flipped and flipped right back. So this isn't easy black and white stuff you can just draw erroneous conclusions from to fit your talking point. Well, let's get to the last part. How long ago did the Big Bang take place? The whole Big Bang hypothesis was constructed to support evolution theory. Without evolution theory, there's no Big Bang. Radioactive decay has fuck all to do with the Big Bang other than shortly thereafter the laws of physics were established. Other than that, it has nothing to do with it. And what does the Big Bang even have to do with evolution? Even fucking less! The Big Bang is a theory, not a hypothesis. It's the best one we have working right now. Does that mean it's correct? No. Does that mean it fits everything we observe? Yes, theories are the descriptive part of all of our data. It's our interpretation. And if it works, then we just keep using it until somebody can whittle away at it or whatever. There are, have been theories that are have been falsified in the past. It's a lot easier to falsify a hypothesis, but theories have been falsified. Like Plutonism, which way back then, it, it was a school of thought and a theory, but that's when the naturalists were still more philosophers than they were scientists. Uh, but that's a talk for another time. Continental drift was a hypothesis. It's been replaced by plate tectonics. It didn't become plate tectonics. Those are not synonyms. Plate tectonics and continental drift are not the same concept. The only thing they have in common is the continents move about the globe. That's it. This is just like, how can you sit there and spew this? It's bullshit. I... I you can sit there and say I'm being unprofessional or I'm bashing a guy all you want, but that's a fact. He portrayed absolutely nothing correctly, except for the carbon-14, the basic part of the carbon-14. Other than that, nothing he has portrayed is what we use, what we do, or what we think. Nothing. It's, and this is the problem. This is the problem. And that's why I waste my time doing stuff like this. 
because I know enough to know these people, when they do certain things, are full of shit. I don't care how many letters they have behind their name. I don't care if they have no letters behind their name. It doesn't matter. When you have an agenda, which we all have, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's bad, but when you start at a conclusion, let's say that, and you try to just argue your way to that conclusion without any actual evidence, you are not doing science. You aren't. You can't say you are. Just because you think science can be whatever you want it to be doesn't mean it can be. All right? Science is a specific thing. It follows a scientific method. Right? If you can't follow that much, which young earth creationists can't even do that, you're not doing science. You can argue, make analogies, make claims till your head falls off. It means nothing. I gotchas, which also don't falsify anything. In order to falsify any scientific concept, you can't just cry foul and then make up a bunch of bullshit. You have to be able, if you have a conclusion. Now, originally was the concept of a 4,500 year old global flood of viable hypothesis. In the early days it was because we didn't have anything else. And it was found that that never happened. The rest of the world moved on, except for these people. They just didn't get the memo. I mean, we have so much evidence now to the contrary that you can't even entertain it. You can't even do it. 200 years ago you could have, but now you can't. Or 150 years ago, whatever it is. So you have to be able to not only falsify the scientific concept, with something more than an argument, and you can't just give lines of evidence, you have to present something that is testable, that makes predictions with your data and your interpretation. That way I can go check you. I can go reproduce your observations or your experiments or your tests to see if you have something or not. And if you do, then I might entertain it. And there are things right now, most of you are probably familiar with the thing going on in cosmology. I'm not a cosmologist. I don't know if that's really happening or not. The, the, what's wrong with cosmology or whatever, or, or uh, astrophysics. But even in geology right now, we are learning some things that are making us rethink some things. What do I mean by that? I don't mean we think the Earth is 6,000 years old. No. It's stuff within the existing concepts, which their core still works, but some of the individual hypotheses are not panning out. All it does is provide new information and change our picture. So we alter the general theory, the concept. That's why science changes when you get new evidence in. It changes to fit the evidence. The evidence doesn't change to fit it, despite the claims made about that. So if you don't like a scientific concept, essentially, in a nutshell, you have to put up or shut up because you don't have anything if you can't do that. you got to follow the scientific process to falsify a scientific concept. You can't just do whatever you think you want to do. Anyway, this is getting long. That's it. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below and I hope you learned something.